it's on. Yeah, I think we're good. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this CG Cookie Wednesday live stream. We do these every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central Time, and that's minus six if you're outside of the States. And usually I post a topic about an hour or two beforehand. Now, for today's stream, I'm going to be doing a bunch of hand studies, and the goal with this one is to do them with you. So I want to do hand studies alongside you. So while people are joining in and while we're kind of getting started and having people uh, jump in, if you guys want to follow along, I put a link below to uh, the hand references that I'm going to be working with. And uh, it just there are eight images on a JPEG. And if you would like to draw these hands, you can. If you want to draw your own, that's okay too. As long as you are working with hands and uh, you're going to explore some different ways of thinking and going about drawing hands. Because in the art community, hands are kind of notorious for being uh, difficult. And I think all of us have gone through a phase of hiding hands, as it's called, where they're either in the pocket or behind the back. So we're going to go through, one, how to avoid that, but definitely uh, showing you tricks on how to kind of embrace hands. Because once you do, I feel like hands become like the center point of your drawings and you really enjoy showing off the hands that you create. So as people are joining in, if you could put where you're watching from in the comments, I always like to see where we are watching from around the world. And then we'll go ahead and get started in a few minutes here. And over this past week, I've been doing a lot of experimenting with uh, digital. And I can show you guys some examples at the end. I'm doing a lot of oil type painting or the look of oil painting digitally. And it's something that I've always been attracted to and kind of enamored by when other digital artists do it. So to finally kind of push myself to learn how they do it on my own, I'm still, still not quite where I want to be, but I would say I'm getting far closer than I ever had in the past. And if you guys have any questions for me while we're streaming, if you could put at CG Cookie Concept before your question or comment, that way while I'm drawing and I'm switching back between the screens that I'm working on, I can easily see it and then I will answer that question to the best of my ability. done with all the marketing stuff there we go there we go and any link that I talk about during the stream I'm gonna be posting in the community section where you guys are downloading the hands from after the stream is over usually about an hour after because I, I go typically eat right after I finish these streams okay I got this up Double checking everything really quick. Okay, so why don't we get started with the shout outs? So, hello, Esbian from Sweden. Oops. Brenda Fitz from Texas. Sergeant Guava, who is working on midterm paper. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, Camion from Minnesota. Max from Washington. John from Indiana. Christy from Oregon. Rami from Hungary. Kratos from Colombia. Walkie in from Florida. Uh, hello, Max Caulfield from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Wow, you're really close by. I'm in Waukesha. Uh, GK Sculpting. Hey, how are you doing? I've been very impressed with your sculpts on the Instagram update. Uh, from the UK. Zane from Ohio. Daniel from Mexico. Uh, Liquid Lindy from Connecticut. Faithful from the Underworld. Well, hello from down below. Tigital says oh you hung out with jazza today that's awesome i will definitely watch that i love jazza and actually i'm gonna be talking about another youtube artist that i was watching mostly today uh cynics he is one of my favorite stylized artists and i'll talk about why during the when we're starting to draw some hands here lady coyote from texas and let's see 
Talk Dark and Geeky says, hello from Rhode Island. I've been psyched to catch a stream live. I've been following on YouTube for a long time. Well, hello. I'm glad you could join us on the stream today. Elias Simone from Sweden. Auxilian from Italy. Lights and Sea from North Carolina. Oh, my mic is quiet. Thank you for telling me, sir. Oh, that's why. All right, now I should be loud and clear, hopefully. And Sam Cap from Chicago. Vamera from Spain. And Gypsy from Southern Oregon. And Wes Burke from Geneva, Illinois. Well, hello, Wes Burke. Okay. So I'm going to switch gears here. And, well, thank you, Sar... Oh, I can't read. It's too small. Sargat Tron, I think it said. Thank you for following. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to switch gears. The only announcement I have for CG Cookie right now is we are hoping to launch a new site on July 12th. Now, that could be pushed back a little further, but just know it is very, very close to being launched. And we at the Cookie Crew are very excited to show you guys the new site. I know some of you have been beta testing it, but just know it is very close to being done. And it, once it is, I will be pushing it very heavily because I'm excited for the site. Now, I'm going to open up my other screen here. There we go. And I'm going to first talk about drawing hands and I think why it's so difficult for artists. One of the things is while we're taught in school how to draw hands, or maybe if you're in high school, you haven't had a proper lesson on drawing hands or how to draw hands, we're kind of taught the very traditional means. And even I've taught this on CG Cookie. And a lot of the times it's focusing on very structural, very boxed out versions of hands. And the more conventions I do and the more I'm meeting these artists that do different styles of drawing, I'm realizing more and more that not only do you need the fundamentals and like the structural or, or structure role uh, analysis of how to draw hands properly, you also need to have some of the looseness and let your lines carry a little more flow into them. Otherwise, hands end up looking really stiff. So I think it is good to go over the basics though. So why don't we start with that and uh, just as a reminder, for those of you who want to draw and paint a hand with me today, please download the reference below and then we will get started after I kind of explain uh, some basic understanding of hands and then we'll get into it. So the first thing I think you should know is the hand is usually thought of like this where it's very flat and all the fingers are touching, but this is not a natural resting state. Normally hands are open and there are spaces between them and all of them go slightly different or at a slightly different angle. And you can kind of think of it as like the core being in your hand and they branch out slightly because when they're stiff and they're all touching, it's actually more of an unnatural position. And even then you still have some holes in between the fingers. So hands, all four fingers should never be completely flat and pressed against each other. I think that's a good thing to note right from the beginning. And also, they are curved from the palm. So obviously, I think you can tell they're different lengths. And even if you look at like a pinky, the second joint is actually kind of aligned with the first joint on your ring finger. So just something to keep in mind that the, the pinky starts a lot lower than your, your ring finger. And that's because the way our skeleton works inside are the bones become longer as it gets to the middle finger. And some people draw the pointer finger just as long as the middle finger, sometimes even longer. You see it in animation a lot to kind of add emphasis to like the direction they're pointing in or like an action line. So it's not that atypical to see that. Now, how you draw your hands and what some of these personal preferences are going or that I'm going to show of my own, just know that these are choices that you're kind of deviating from pure realism, but that is totally okay. I feel like the best artists at drawing hands are the ones that kind of make it their own or really allow their intuition take over while drawing hands and that's why you you see these great ones all right so the other things that are important to note are your uh the webbing between your fingers i think this is one of the most important things that artists tend to miss is between each finger there's actually a little dip and it almost looks like the fingers extend into the actual hand part and we, we miss that. And if you flip your hand around on the palm, it stops. So it looks more flat and in 
kind of uh, flat against the palm side, but on this side, the fingers really do kind of extend. The lines go lower, and you can see that. Whereas this side, they kind of stop abruptly where the, the top of the palm is. And the other good thing to note, our hands are not completely flat, and they're not these uh, boxy objects that were kind of trained in, or at least that I was in college on how to draw them. They are fleshy. They have a lot of hills and valleys within them. And I think it's good to note these kind of fleshier parts of your hand, you want to bubble up and you want to give it some curve to it. And if you can think of like the palm of your hand when you're like holding water or something, it has those ridges along the outside, the more fleshy parts of the hand, and that's what holds the water in. If our hands really were just a box, it would be really hard to contain any kind of liquid because it would fall right off. So keep the mo and I'm going to keep repeating that throughout this live stream of hands are meant to be more curvy and fleshy. I'm going to break the rigidity that we're taught of having them be so boxy and like straight and very to, um, I don't want to say to the book, but the way that I was taught was very different than how I feel today. And that's why I'm going to keep repeating the idea of hands being curvy. Let's see what else I have on this. Oh, yeah, here's another good example of this is the way I was taught, where you break the hand into three different areas. You have the pentagon, which is kind of the palm of your hand. And the reason it's a pentagon and not a square is because you can see, it's actually easier to see on this side, on the hand, the point actually goes out here before going back down into the wrist. It's not a straight line from your pointer finger to your wrist. It goes out to your thumb and then in. A lot of people like to see this as a triangle as well. Whatever is easiest for you. And the more that I realize how to teach drawing, the more I have to kind of include the idea that there isn't one way to draw. There isn't one magical lesson that you can watch and it works for you. You gotta try a bunch of variations of methods and teaching and in the way that teachers teach because what one teacher might say doesn't work for you, another will and you'll gravitate towards the ones that do. So even with this example here, yeah, I'm breaking it down into the pentagon, the fingers, and the thumb, but then when you have these kind of weirder angles, like you can see here, I'm gonna make a new layer, it's really hard to see the pentagon in this example, or actually any of the three, because they're at an uh, angle toward the camera where it's not completely flat. And I think we're taught so much of how to draw hands from like a flat orthographic view. And I think that's why I used to struggle drawing hands at like different angles. Like imagine if it was like this, if you can see my little camera here, how am I supposed to explain where the Pentagon when the hand is coming directly at the camera? So instead I have a new way of teaching hands and I'll explain how, what that is when we get to it. And then the last thing, this one I still feel is relevant on how the sizes of your knuckles are actually a little different. The first joint, so from your the big knuckle to the first bend, this is usually double the size of the other two joints. And from the palm side, they actually seem the same. You can see like the spacing between them are roughly the same, but from this side, usually when we're looking at uh, knuckle to knuckle, it is a bit longer. It's not just the little where the two creases are. And the other really important thing that I, I always remember is on your fingers, you can see how usually the first joint has two lines where the second one only has one. So if you're ever bending your fingers, try to have a double line in the first joint here and a single line on the, the last one. And even with closer to the palm, usually these have two or kind of scattered looking lines. They're not as connected as the ones right at that first joint. And then the last joint is that single line. Okay, oops. There we go. Okay, so then the other thing I wanted to note, let's see here, what, did I, what do I have? Oh yeah, we have an entire exercise on drawing hands in different gestures. So if you guys are curious about doing even more hand studies after this, 
I think it's good to at least draw a hand a week. I usually do a scribble of a hand on either my post-it note in front of me or in my sketchbook just to keep, you know, that knowledge there and frequent because I feel as a character artist, you should be comfortable with drawing hands. And if you do want to be a character artist someday, I think you have to become comfortable with drawing hands. I don't think there's a way around it. And I think the more that you embrace it, the more that your characters will feel more dynamic because then you're, you're putting them in poses that allow the hand to kind of steal the show and be a showstopper. So this is a good exercise. It is on the site right now. These are hand references. Oh, I did a painting a hand tutorial earlier this year, but I think what I didn't go into was to, um, how to keep it more fluid and how to train yourself to draw hands where this had more of a rigid approach and it was more on like color and shading. So I'm not gonna do so much of a shading tutorial today as I'm just specifically really zoning in on drawing hands. And even this one, we have an exercise on subsurface scattering. And I think with uh, hands and anything fleshy, you should know that light usually penetrates through the skin. Well, I think you OD01. And light can be seen on the other side of your, uh, your any type of flesh if it's thin enough. So you usually see it on like the back of ears, your hands, sometimes a nose if you get the right angle and uh, your feet. So just something to keep in mind with drawing hands. That's why sometimes you see artists kind of play up subsurface scattering in their hand drawings because it adds such a neat little element to it. And also uh, with anything fleshy, especially hands, you can be a little more, you can exaggerate the darker areas of like having it be more red, especially like in the knuckles or where it bends and then have it be a little more uh, I, I want to say desaturated where the bone is pushing closer to the skin. And it's another little trick to keep in mind. I usually just do a gradient so the fingers are a little darker and then it becomes lighter as you get into the palm. Uh, typically you tend to see that fingers can be a, a touch darker and I exaggerate it even more. Well, I thank you, Ava Darling 25 for following. So if you're ever feeling like your hands are lacking any kind of interest or they're not very... Uh, cool to look at, add a gradient, and then blend it in, see how it looks. But uh, don't just feel you have to follow realism exactly. And I'm telling you this from someone who does realism all the time. If you're not comfortable with it, or if you're, you, you feel like it's lacking some creative depth, uh, don't feel like you have to constrain yourself just to realism. Let's see here. Oh yeah, and then I'm just posting some more examples of how many hand studies I've done in my past. And even today, I'm still learning about new ways to draw hands. So even though I do, like, usually a, a hand study a year where it's kind of this collage. I did this one two years ago, and I did the Silent King drawing last year. I'm still learning new things. And the more you get comfortable with drawing hands, I promise you your characters will look so much better. And there are still times I struggle with hands. And I, I, I will say it does get easier, but there will be some times where you get hung up on a drawing a hand because they can be difficult. You have a lot of joints and angles to look at. Oh, and actually, while I'm doing that, I just was reminded, fingers do not bend down at like a straight line. When you grasp something, the fingers go toward the center point in the middle of your palm. I should use this hand without the glove. So whenever you're having a character grab onto something or they're doing a fist, always have the fingers angle in, not just angle straight down. I'm trying to like do it, but it's so unnatural. Yeah, I can't do it. So even if your hand is doing something like this, this is how you can get you know, your, your thumb and pinky to touch and you get these kind of different angles. But if you're drawing hands, also try to make them visually appealing. You wanna make your hand something that people would want to look at. So having your hand at like, let's see a cool angle here. So an angle like that, let's see, like that would be cooler than something like this where it just isn't as appealing. So if you're ever needing to draw a more appealing hand, take a reference photo of your own hand and get yourself in a good position and really look at, okay, where are the lights and shadows? Do I have any overlap between fingers? Which I recommend having overlap between fingers. And yeah, take a reference photo and then draw it alongside your character. Okay, I think we're now gonna get into some drawing here. 
Let's see if I have any other last minute tips. Oh, fingernails are always a problem. I, I feel like they're one of the hardest things to explain to someone. Uh, besides just practice them, uh, don't make them too big, don't make them too small. Have them fit within the finger. If you cut your fingernails or if your character has cut fingernails, have them fit within the actual lining of the finger. And besides that, I would say at an angle, you can see that usually the nail has a bit of a hump to it and then it sinks slightly into the skin right near the tip. Let me see. I don't know if you guys can see that. But you can see how it has that little bump before it goes into the skin of the first joint. Okay, so if you guys are ready to draw with me, if you're going to draw with me, I'm gonna pull up the references of some hands. Oh, you know what, no, first I wanna do blind, uh, just warm up sketches. I think it's good to just see where your knowledge base is at first, rather than in, like immediately relying on outside references to capture what you're trying to uh, look for. So let's see, while I'm switching over here, let's, if we have any questions. Uh, Ela Simone one says, guess what I just bought an eraser pencil, just like the one you have. It will get a lot easier now. I don't have to use my one diameter big eraser. Yeah, it is awesome. For those of you who don't know what eraser we're talking about, it's called a mono, I believe a mono zero eraser. I use the circle one and I use it for my traditional drawings and I love it. I use it all the time. Uh, Christy McAbee says, I got an issue where whenever I'm drawing hands, I run out of space for the pinky. So I end up with a total of fi four fingers instead of five. Is it because I'm not scaling it correctly? Uh, possibly, we'll go over that too. I don't think this is something you have to worry about too much because I think it, uh, you, if, you're, if you're lining it up beforehand, you're overthinking it then already. So let's start doing some warm-up sketches. And for those of you who are working with me today, let's do it for about 10 minutes. What time is it here? Okay, and I'm gonna set a timer over here. So if you're going to draw with me, get out your either sketchbook, or if you're doing it digitally, do it. Open up your Photoshop file, get whatever brush you normally work with. And let's go. All right. So the way that I'm going to be doing some of my hand studies is the way, why thank you, Jay Fordota for following, is the way that I, and thank you, Arikensaya, uh, oh, that was horrible. I'm sorry, but thank you for following. Uh, it's kind of the way that uh, Cynics talks about in his video where exaggerate it, let it be more goofy and not so focused on being realistic. So even though I'm a realism artist, I'm gonna treat this very animated and I'm gonna let them be very loose and gestural. And I want you guys to try to do the same because we'll do the more realistic kind of more proportioned out hands. But I think it's good to warm up with these kind of animated looking hands. Capture those joints. You know what, I'm gonna turn my opacity off actually. There we go. Oop. Let me make sure I still have the, the comments open. All right. Oop. Keep switching on me, there we go. There we go, that's the, I'm gonna turn my diameter down. Okay, now remember, don't use reference, don't even look at your own hand right now. I want you to rely purely on your energy, your intuition. And I'm gonna be doing probably a lot of, and you'll, you'll notice it too, I tend to put the two middle fingers, your middle finger and your ring finger, uh, together, I feel like they have this aesthetic between them. I really like how they look. And try not to spend too much time on just one individual hand. So as soon as you do one, move on to the next. Or at least when you get it to a place where you can tell it's pretty finished looking, 
move on to the next. Or if you find yourself wanting to detail, that's when you definitely know you should move on to the next. Let me answer some questions while I'm doing this. I'll move my brush settings over here. Uh, SamCab22 says, I was watching the Painterly Mole stream from last year on YouTube and was wondering where I could download the brush you use. It wasn't exactly a chalk brush, but the texture it left was phenomenal. I will leave that in the community forum post for this. So where you download the hand reference, I'll put the, the download to that brush there. Well, I think you cross Unity 1 and Kai3315 for following. And I hope for those of you that are watching, you're also uh, hopefully doing some hand studies alongside me. Because as much as I enjoy doing these streams, I, I want to feel like uh, I'm, I'm helping you guys with your own art if you guys are artists. And then I'm here for any questions that you may have while you're doing it. Now, some of these hands are gonna look a little jank, and that's okay. If anything, Cynics was saying how, and the reason I keep bringing it up because his was like the last tutorial I watched before I did this stream. He was saying purposely like space out the fingers even more than you normally would because he sees a lot of younger artists oops, that place them too close together. And I think it's good to get in the habit of and I agree with them. I think it's good to get in the habit of spacing them out because spaced out fingers will always feel better than fingers that are too close. Give them some knuckle lines. And obviously this is very simplified and exaggerated, but it kind of gives the same impression that I'm talking about where you want the hand uh, to, f to have more energy to it because otherwise they'll read too stiff. So exaggerating them can actually help it even though you're breaking a little away from uh, true realism. Uh, Tigil says, I have to go sadly, but I'm gonna rewatch the stream later on. Bye guys. Bye Tigil. Hope you have fun doing whatever Tigil does outside of the art life. Let's have a really exaggerated hand. And I think I'm gonna really push some of these exaggerations just so I can even prove to you guys that as a realism artist, I need to find how important exaggeration is within my own work. So don't be afraid to make your fingers look ugly and extend them. Uh, Tall, Dark, and Geeky says, so I'm beginner steps to taking my art seriously as a career. When you talked about having multiple sources of income, that really resonated with me. I was wondering what was the best ways to gain commissions. I put out a commission notice on my art Instagram, but got no bites. Also, where can I find the best outlets to help me gain exposure, like contests, art pages, etc.? So my number one piece of advice was really post your art anywhere and everywhere that you can, especially in the digital art age that we live in. It is so easy to get exposure. I mean, there's definitely the challenge of you're fighting against all these other artists looking for exposure as well, but... Uh, if you don't put your art on pretty much every social media that you can, or the more that you do it, the more exposure that you're open to, the more that you restrict yourself. If you only post on Instagram, then you're only relying on Instagram's uh, exposure rate. And I can tell you now, even with like the last Kickstarter I had, surprisingly, DeviantArt was my number two uh, traction. And I think a lot of people give DeviantArt a bad a name but it was my number two in terms of getting exposure and getting people to come and pledge for the book. So don't just write one off because you may have heard that uh, it wasn't as good as another, uh, another outlet. Because even Facebook, even though it's become more business-like, well, this is a weird thumb here, I would still have an art page on uh, Facebook and post there. You never know where someone could... Uh, see your work and possibly maybe like uh, buy one of your books off you from your Etsy store because they saw you on Facebook because someone's grandma shared you out. You know, like you never know how someone finds you. I mean, you could ask, but 
for the most part, it's usually pretty random. Now, in terms of getting commissions and that kind of stuff, it's going to be tough, especially getting started. I don't want to sugarcoat it. So keep pushing out your commission rate every now and then. Make sure that you understand that maybe starting off, it's going to be hard to even get one bite. So keep making examples of what your commissions will look like. Really push for quality. And over time, you should get to a point where uh, even if you're only getting one, it, then okay, good, you got one. That was your first goal is what was to get a commission. And then your next goal, the next time you do commission, should be two. And even with that, if you only get one next time or if you don't get any the next time, you can't let that defeat you. It's very easy to get a defeatist attitude in art because we feel like we're constantly being judged or that we're not good enough if we don't get a reception that we're looking for, especially in terms of like likes and comments. You see it all the time in today's day and age. And I admittedly, I've been someone that I think every now and then I do get caught in the, the whirlwind of trying to uh, gain exposure, doing art specifically for the idea of um, pushing something out because you haven't posted in a while. So just know that that is something that uh, a bunch of artists, not just newcomers, think about and uh, deal with. Oops, I keep looking at my references, but I, I forgot that I'm supposed to be doing these blind. Okay, let's have some overlap here. Now, some people like to think of the fingers bending as like boxes, or some people do them as like shapes where they'll draw circles at every joint. I just recommend doing whatever works best for you. And like I said near the beginning, try a bunch of ways of doing it. So don't just watch like my videos, watch Jazz's videos, watch Cynics, watch Psychra, watch all the other people on even like schoolism. If they have courses specifically on hands, I would check them out. Because the more, and honestly, there's something that you can learn from each teacher. I feel like even if their style isn't something that you're attracted to, per se, there's something that you can still learn and apply to your own style that the teacher that maybe you do really like, they don't create their hands in that manner. Oh, that's my timer. Oh boy, I wanted to get a lot more done than just that in 10 minutes. That's what happens when I'm jabbering away. All right, so hopefully you guys got some hands to start off with. I think I may even do uh, one more warm-up. Let me see what I wrote down here. Yeah, we're going to do one more warm-up round. And these aren't going to be as exaggerated, so we're going to go for a little bit more towards a realistic-looking hand. And just know that uh, if you were having fun, if you were learning things about exaggerating hands or finding shapes and curves within them, then keep doing that. Because I feel like when you find something or you stumble upon something new that is working for you, I definitely recommend and push for you to continue doing that. Because then you, you're in that like learning phase. Your mind is like actively thinking about what you're learning. So keep doing that then. So I'm going to reset my timer here. So we're going to do the same thing. 10 minutes. And go. Okay, let's see here. Question from... Brandy Fitz 45 says, can you do like an extreme foreshortening, like a hand coming straight at you or bending away? Absolutely. And you know what? I'm going to do one kind of in the style, stylized uh, vein. I, mean, I'm, I almost want to do this blind, but I feel like it would turn out better if I actually did a reference in front of me here. And the beauty about doing hands is like you have your reference right there. Whenever you need a hand reference, you got the hand that you're not dominant with just waiting. Oh, it's funny. Immediately as I start using reference, I feel like things start clicking a lot better. That's another thing. Don't feel like you have to go at it blind and like only true artists can do uh, realism stuff blind. Even the best realism artist or even like uh, illustrator artists for like the magic cards and things where there are specific poses that the client is looking for, they take reference photos. They usually hire a model and they'll get a photo shoot 
scheduled and done. Oops. Let's just pretend my arm was coming from way out in the distance. I feel like I can exaggerate that even more actually. Something like that. And even, you know what, let me do one going away from the body. I feel like that's something that we don't see enough of either. You know, I gotta take off my, my wristband here. And I always find it funny, like sometimes at conventions I'll draw my own hand, just as practice. And some people I'm sure walking past my booth are like, what is that guy doing? <laughs> because if they don't see my drawing pad, I just look like I'm doing a weird hand position. <laughs> once again, I'm still exaggerating some of these shapes here. And then once I get into once I finish this foreshortening one, then I'm gonna really kind of push for a little bit more of a realistic looking hand. But like I said, I think it's good to exaggerate shapes. Even when I'm messing around on my iPad Pro, I'm usually sitting in my bed before I go to sleep and I'm drawing these hands and I usually draw a bunch of body shapes as like a life study example. And just a little more practice drawing characters. And they always are very exaggerated. I'm really pushing uh, the forms. Yeah, there we go, something like that. So I, I almost embrace how almost surreal they look. And I let that be the basis for when I need to pull back then on doing a more realistic look. And I think that's what I should talk about with you guys is when you're doing these hand studies, Rather than it being very stiff and then near the end trying to make it look more dynamic, start over dynamic and then try to pull back to make it look more real. It's something that I definitely struggled with uh, myself. And I've kind of learned to be okay with having the energy and the gesture lines have a flow to them first and then pulling back near the rendering stage. Because then at least your foundations, they have way more energy than if you just kind of go at it uh, with just a realism mindset. Oops, I don't want to work with black though. All right, so now I'm gonna look at, I took one of my hand references here and I'm just capturing the, the big lines that feel the most gestural in my head and the ones that I want to capture the most. Oops, I'm getting a little too exaggerated though again. And mind you, having an exaggerated or stylized look isn't bad, but I think when you're doing a realism study, trying to keep it close to that realistic proportion is helpful in the long run. Because then you can always stylize it later on, but really trying to learn how proportions work First, I do find important. And even with the fingers, usually they're kind of the same size and width going up the finger, but usually the knuckles may have a bit of a, a bump to them. Since I know there's gonna be overlap on the fingers here. I'm leaving some space for it. So 
Same with this the pinky finger. And if there is like a little trick that helps you to draw fingers while you're creating them, work with that and try to build upon it. So I know some people see them as like the circles or the ringlets. Some people see them as rounded boxes. Whatever works for you. And you can see usually when I go a little slower, the hand is a little lumpier, which isn't a bad thing. I think too many people, including myself, would draw the human anatomy with a lot of straight lines. And that was honestly the best advice I have been told this year. Besides, actually, Tijel told me money comes and goes, and I really like that saying. But in terms of art, it's the idea that the body has no straight lines. And I, I've, I've really latched onto that. And I've allowed myself to be okay with some of my line work not feeling completely uh, stiff and straight. And I think all it took was being okay with there being more curves within my realism work. Something like that. Actually, that wrist is a bit big. There we go. So we got two minutes left. Let me let me sneak one more in. I'll do. I'll do kind of a fun one here. And for those of you working alongside me right now, know that we have less than two minutes. So either start a new one, or if you're really keeping these more gestural, just keep going. Don't lose that, that speed right now. Because as you can see, sometimes when I, I do something a little more realistic, I definitely tend to get a touch slower. And that's why I like warming up first. Because it reminds me of how fast I can go, but it's like I choose to go slower to try to capture accuracy. But sometimes in capturing accuracy, you lose energy. And that's not a good trade-off. I used to think it was. I can tell you now, it's not. Um, let's see here. Mango Pro says, using a reference doesn't make you less of an artist. Uh, thank you for that reminder. I feel like a lot of art tutorial makers online act like it's wrong or cheating to learn from reference, but what else are we supposed to learn from? Smiley face. I agree. I, I feel like even the masters, think about it, when they had... Uh, drawings of a still life, they usually had their subject matter right in front of them. So they were using reference. It would just happen to be real life reference instead of like Google search. But if the masters were alive today, they'd probably be using a lot of the same techniques that most of us are using. And I think it's ridiculous to think the only way I see it as cheating or wrong is if you're, you're doing a reference study of like, let's say someone else's art, and then you claim it as your own. I do have a lot of problems with that so even within this own uh, this this video of me doing these hand studies I'm referencing cynics a lot because some of these hands I feel like are looking a lot like his and to not give him credit wouldn't be fair or right to him And there we go. All right, let me turn that off. All right, so we're going to take a quick, like, let's say a five-minute break, and then we'll take, I want to say, let's take three of these and then refine them in terms of their line art, and then we'll go into coloring and shading a couple of them as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to select three of them during our little break here. I'm going to choose, I really like how this one turned out. So we'll grab that one. We'll grab 
Let's see here. You know what? I'd, I'm going to grab an exaggerated one as well. Let's see. Do I want that one or do I want... Uh, that one's too similar to the first one. That one. Then as our last one, let's see here. You know what, maybe we'll do one of the extreme angle ones. I feel like that'll be a good challenge. So for those of you drawing with me, pick three of the ones that you just did. It could have been in the first or second warm-up. And create a slightly bigger size of each. Because then we're going to get ready to paint them. For me, we got one stylized, one extreme, and then one more on the realistic side. All right, and then I'm going to answer a couple more questions while we're on this break here. Ari Kensia. I think I'm going to say Ari from now on says, hello there. I was just wanting to say thank you so much for doing what you do. I found your videos on YouTube and watching them has given me more motivation to work harder as an artist. It's my first time at one of your streams and I hope to catch many more. Well, welcome to the, your first live stream here. Thank you once again for all your hard work. I can't wait to see more of your content. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much for coming. And I'm glad that uh, you found them on YouTube. And I guess I should mention for any of you that are watching this stream in the future on YouTube, if you're doing these studies, I'll put a link in the description box on where you can post your finals. And that way you can see what other people uh, posted as well and hopefully get some critique if you're looking for that. Uh, GK Sculpting says, I'm doing good, thank you. Learning the art of sculpting hair. I did not expect that sculpting hair would give me such grief. The braided hair took me about 10 to 12 hours to sculpt. Oh yeah, that's quite a lot, but uh, it looked really good in the end, so keep up the good work. Okay. Uh, Mangle Pro says, I feel like drawing rubber gloves. Yeah, anytime a character is wearing gloves, uh, even the example that Cynix has was with cartoon characters. You'll see a lot of characters wear gloves, like Mickey Mouse, and they're very rounded out, and there's definitely a space between each finger. And then the lines that are on the back of the, the glove represent the, or the representative of the tendons in our fingers, and you can see those lines here, and that's why there's lines on the back of his glove. So having character wearing gloves definitely makes it a little easier. And even with my characters for my sword playbook, I love doing like half finger gloves. Because then I feel like I can have fun with having the bottom knuckle area. Have more of like a leather texture to it. And then you can have like the little holes in it you see some gloves have that especially like for bike uh, riders when they're riding or even like uh, motorcycles let's just give them a thumb one too so i feel like with gloves you can have a lot of fun with them so i would try out not only drawing hands by themselves naked but have them have like rings on have them have uh, bracelets or a glove on anything that will add a little bit more of a, an accessory quality and it does sometimes make it a little more tricky oh this mango pro says i feel like i'm drawing gloves <laughs> um that's not necessarily a bad thing it might mean your your angles are too smooth and uh, i would try angling some of them out usually like the the knuckle areas like try just pushing more of a point on some of those and that might help with that adding some angularity to it i know i have a problem with making everything too smooth and curvy or not in a good way but in a very like stiff everything feels like a straight line 
where hands are supposed to be a bit more dynamic looking. So have a bit more of humps, or even if you want to exaggerate some of those areas and you'll see a difference. Okay, so on these, see are they on one layer? Okay, I have them on one layer. I'm gonna lower the opacity of these. I'm just gonna do a quick pass on each. And I think through uh, doing some of these, since I'm, I blew them up, I have a much smaller brush now to work with. I'm just gonna point out on uh, little details that I'm adding and how you can do this on your own as well. So the first thing that I'm definitely gonna look at is where I can add some skin fold and wrinkling, especially on a stylized hand and really let that kind of take over here. And if you need to, just put your hand in that position. And since this one doesn't have to be super uh, realistic, have fun with some of your brush strokes. Let them be longer. Give them some more confident angles. And with this thumb joint bent back so far, I'm gonna play up the wrinkles on this side of the thumb and then the other side, keep it very tight. I think on here, yeah, give it more of that line of action there. And oftentimes I like to hint at like a shadow box. That's why you might see me go a little lighter with my line weights. even on up here. And I, I know that fingers aren't supposed to come to like an exact point, but when they're stylized, you can have fun with the proportions. And even like I was saying with the joints, I'm gonna bump them out. I'm gonna over exaggerate them. It's kind of like uh, sometimes with like old villains and cartoons, if you think of like the old Snow White Witch when she becomes older or uh, Nymphodemus from The Secret of Nim. They have these very long, very bony looking knuckles and uh, they're purposely exaggerated. A lot of the times we get the impression of age or uh, scary. They're like the villain character. Even here, I'm kind of allowing myself to have more fun with my line weight since usually I have such a chicken scratchy way of uh, treating my digital art. And it's one of those things that I always say, if you want to break a habit, it's crazy if you're doing the same thing or same techniques expecting something to change. And the pinky, I think one of my favorite things from Cynix's video was talking about how the middle two fingers are kind of like in a relationship with each other and he likes shipping them and that's why he likes to draw them together. But the pinky likes to be by itself. And even if you just kind of hold your hand at a normal stance, the pinky usually is the most spaced out of all the fingers. And it can really have some range to it where you can even like point it at a weird direction. So I, for my stylized hands, I like to over-exaggerate the spacing between the middle fingers and the pinky and just almost push the gap between them. And that's why you see this pinky over here really pushing how far away it is.
I think it's good for you guys to also see that even though I consider myself more of uh, someone that is classically trained, that you can have fun with different styles and uh, pushing yourself to try new things. And there's things that will carry over into your other work. So even with my line weighting being so different or the way that I'm exaggerating these lines, what I'm picking up on is energy and how I can apply that energy then to more of my realism studies. Something like that. So if I hide the layer underneath, so you can see it's a very lumpy, weird kind of a hand, but I like it. I like how different it is compared to what I normally draw. And I know that it's not going for 100% realism, but I'm trying to just over-exaggerate the different nuances that I see in the hand to kind of make mental notes of, oh, okay, that's an area where you want to give it a slight curve or a slight bump. Okay, now for the extreme one, I'm going to stick in the same vein as our first one and have this one be a bit stylized as well. Now this one, I'm not going to look at my hand for reference and just see what I can create without uh, using my hand as like a guide almost. So even with extreme for shortening, where I'm even working on like a more stylized looking hand, having reference will always help add little nuances that maybe you uh, wouldn't have thought to add. Because usually when we're doing something blind, we're pulling from images or past drawings that we've already done. And it, we're just looking and almost relying on muscle memory to help create that. So even with like those lines back there, I'm exaggerating those bumps and I'm really pushing for a focus on uh, each joint and how it works. And then after I have kind of a basis for me to look at, then I'm gonna look at my hand for reference and see, okay, what more can I pick up on now that I have a reference in front of me? Uh, and I feel like I have a pretty good outline, so let me open up my hand again. So immediately I see some shadow play that I want to work with. Got some bumping over here. Yeah, look how weird, and look how flat this looks back here. I love that. I've definitely learned to appreciate things that are outside of the realism realm. And I think too for too long, I've looked at realism as being like the right way to go about looking at a drawing rather than seeing it as one way that you can possibly go. But... For the artists that I really like, even my roommate, uh, Key, or better known online as Gawky, I really like how much freedom her work seems to have, and she kind of creates her own guidelines for her work. And I've, That's something that I've very recently learned to really appreciate. I think that's why I've even allowed some of my traditional stuff to be definitely inspired by realism, but... Uh, to give myself some guidelines where I break what is realistic in uh, my lighting scenario, for example, 
not I'm okay with it being unrealistic. Because it usually because it adds to the composition or it adds a different uh, mood that I was looking for. So here, honestly, spacing is so important when drawing hands. And for those of you that are following along with your own hands, just know that if there is a chance that you can open the spacing a bit and it not breaking the illusion of it being a hand, and I feel like you'd have to really push the gap for it to not look like a hand, I would go for it. I think that it's one of those things that separate separates an artist that doesn't know how to draw hands from artists that typically uh, do. So the one thing that I, I kind of find a bit boring with realism hands is I feel like the fingers are generally the same size and you can't break too much of uh, the look of them because then they'll start to look more cartoony, unfortunately. And for those of you who uh, downloaded the reference sheet, I'm looking at hand number six. And I thought I was going to be following it a bit more closely than I, I am for the stream. But I think it's good to kind of use more of the imagination and using your own hand as a reference from life right there and then. I'm actually going to make the wrist a bit bigger here. So oftentimes you see artists do this kind of thing where they, they draw or they lower the opacity of what they've already drawn. Usually it's because they can pick up on like the little edits that they need to make to help it feel more like uh, the reference image that you're trying to capture here. And in this case, you can even see that the hand is a, I, I like, I pushed the pinky a little higher than it should have been. So I'm almost compensating for that in the rest of the shaping of some of the hand. So here, I don't want to take too much of your guys' time doing like these small little details. And just know that we're going to get into painting the hand after. Why, oh, thank you, Bun Muffins, for following. That's a great username. Welcome, Bun Muffins. Oh, another artist that I could recommend you guys checking out that uh, kind of plays with exaggeration of the human body but has a really nice end result look to them is an artist that we met at conventions this year named, uh, there's actually two of them. They're a married couple. It's Shai and uh, Shai Kus, Kus oh, I can't, I can never say it right. Custis or Kustis and Koi Kun. There are two artists that really have fun with uh, the human body and exaggerating some areas while still retaining the human form in, in a very, very delicate way. But, uh, Koei plays very much with like shapular and oops. Oh, I spilled some of my water. That's okay. But he plays with like adding weight to the body and having these skin folds be like exaggerated and heavy. And then Shai has very like delicate thin lines and they're more intricate looking. Do a quick wipe down here. Thankfully, nothing was damaged. 
You know what? And I have to say, of all the streams I've ever done, I think this is the first time I've ever spilled something live on a stream. Get the iPad out of there. Right. I'll clean up the rest after. So now, back to the hand. Let's see where I left off. So yeah, I would definitely recommend checking them out. And like I said, any artist that I am mentioning on the stream, I'll put a link to their work on the community uh, forum page where you can also download the hand references. And now I'm just looking at like all these little wrinkles on the edge here. Something like that. Now, I did notice that my fingers were a little too high. So I'm going to quickly do a liquefy passed on my last hand here. Normally, I do not recommend using a liquefy filter to help you with your proportions. But I think for the sake of the stream, and for time's sake, I'm just going to go ahead and edit it here. OK. And I really like this foreshortened one. So now we can have some color added. Now, oftentimes, if, if you guys are working traditionally, I'll do a quick kind of example of how to add some shading to your stuff. I mean, if you're working digitally and don't want to work in color, what I would do is like look at any edge and add some shading to it. I really like reverse or contrast shading where essentially you shade on one side of a form and then the other side you keep relatively light or almost like pure white and it gives off this contrast in the end so if i was working traditionally right now this is probably how i would shade this hand or not probably this is how i would shade the hand well i thank you raven underscore mad for following and clumsy nick Thank you for stumbling upon us. So even here, you can really play with some of those forms back there. And usually while I'm doing more like traditional shading like this, I find some areas where I can either add more lines to, then I'll just shade them out. But oftentimes I'll leave it pretty blank. Now, let's say that we really wanted emphasis on this back finger for whatever reason. We could do one of two things. You could gradient it out. Or then, like, this has a very harsh gradient from, like, a very light, in this case, white value. And then it gets progressively darker as it goes back. That's one way, but my personal favorite is just adding a background value because usually lighter values will pop up and darker values will recede. And if I was working traditionally, I would take my finger and I would smudge some of this out here. But you kind of get my drift on what I'm doing. And then maybe have like some shading inside. Let's say that knuckle could use. Something like that. And then I would just rinse and repeat for the other four fingers. If I really wanted to like make this hand feel more contrasted. And then maybe the, the pinky, in this case, the finger more in the foreground. I'll just leave it as like a light, a very light surrounding of color where the ones back here maybe are darker. 
Now, this is definitely more of a style choice. This isn't like end all be all, this is the way you should do something. But you can see how it really does bring the hand forms more forward here. Whereas before, it was lacking some of that. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a quick pass on coloring. Let's see, I created a quick little skin palette before. And so for those of you who wanted to paint digitally, I would get ready now. I'll give you guys like a two minute little break here and we'll jump into it just so you guys are ready. Uh, the palette that I'm working with is just a general skin palette, nothing too crazy. But I would say the general color I'm working with, if you want to work with the same color that I am, is let's I'll pull it up on the screen here. C18269. C18. Oh, was it a two or was it a six? 269. So that is this color. And then the lighter one, let's see what that is. E0, B5. Oh gosh, this is hard. E0, B5. E0, B5. I believe A1. Let me double check. All right, and that's the lighter skin tone. So if you want to work with the same colors I am, you can just go ahead and color pick those. Otherwise, you can choose your own. I even like when people kind of rely on their intuition for color picking. I definitely recommend that, especially from doing studies. But if you want to work with like greens and blues and make more of a surreal looking hand, that's cool too. You know what, I'm just gonna write this one as well. This is BA483D. D, okay. Okay, you guys getting ready? Let me see if you have any questions here and then we'll get started. Sergeant Guava says, do you have any tips to attain that freedom that Gawky has? I am tired of making things look correct when I try to stray from realism, my art just looks amateurish. Uh, the reason artists like her, or uh, even some of my favorite, even like cynics, or the artists that do have more exaggerated forms to their, their work, the reason usually is because they have such a strong understanding of the fundamentals of proportions and shading and color and light that they can then like pull from what they learn from that and create their own language of art. And that's why it usually stands out so much is because they created essentially at that point their own style. And you always hear about people trying to find their own style. But oftentimes, you don't go looking for one. You just create one through the process of figuring out what you like, what you don't like. And over time of doing enough drawings, you realize this is, you kind of end up with a style. You trip into it. You stumble upon a style. And you didn't even realize when that point of creating one happened. It just is a multitude of many decisions over a long period of time of what you like and what you don't and then you apply that to your drawings. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get started on painting this. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a backdrop. So since hands are generally more warm, let's create a cool backdrop. I'll do a, a green, greeny color here. You know, I'll just fill in the space rather than having like awkward white zones. And like I said, this isn't going to be a tutorial on shading, so I'm going to leave it up to you on how you want to go about shading your work. I'm going to, however, make my skin outline slightly darker, more saturated. Oops. So to do that, grab the layer that has your hands on it. Let me make sure my camera isn't blocking this. It definitely is. Okay, let me move that down. So whenever you want to just affect whatever you have in the layer that you're working on, click the layer, choose the lock button on the top with the checkerboard, and then fill it in. You can see how it will only paint in whatever we had. Oh, you know what though? That's pretty dark. I'm gonna make I'm gonna make our background layer a little lighter. So it's easier for you guys to see. There we go. Is that better or is that even worse? Hold on, you know what? I'll make 
this a touch more saturated and dark as well. That should give us enough contrast here. All right, so I'm going to make a new layer. And you know what? I'm going to actually start doing this for all of future tutorials and live streams because I always get asked, or not always, but every now and then I get asked what color palettes I'm working with, and I think this is the best way to have someone not have to take a screenshot, bring it in a Photoshop color pick. They can just type in the number. Okay, so I'm going to fill it in. Let's see here. What brush do I want to use for this? I want to use... Recently, I've actually been using this brush, which is like, it gives you slightly different uh, color variations. And you know what, for those of you curious on how to create a brush like this, in the brush settings, actually it's down here, all you do is you turn color dynamics on. And if you can kind of, if you have an understanding of hue, saturation, and brightness, which if you don't, we have an entire course on that. And that's probably the most cohesive full course of it definitely is on color that we have and you can go check that out on the site but essentially if you think about it, if we wanted like a really high hue jitter now when we place the the brush down our hue is going to shift like crazy on brush strokes so we should expect to see some greens and blues in here while we put the brush down and yeah you can see we have a lot of weird colors that typically aren't associated with the color that we have selected so if we turn that all the way up, then we should really get the rainbow. And that's exactly what we're getting. It looks like cereal or something. So if we turn it down, you can see how, yeah, we're still getting some variation of color, but for the most part, it's in that warm range. But if you turn it even further down, now you're getting a very little hue jitter. So it's very much contained within more of a skin color of that fleshy Caucasian skin. It has more of like a red tint to it. And then same could be said for saturation. You can see how now we have very saturated skin tone and a very desaturated all in the same brush stroke. I try not to have these jitters up too high on any of them, but I'd like to have all of them have just a slight jitter. But I don't think I want to use, well, no, you know what, maybe I will use this brush just to show you guys like another example of how to paint something. Because I think too often I show only one way of like how to paint something. So I think it's good to see other ways of uh, doing so. So first thing first, I'm just going to fill in all these areas. And any area that goes a little too outside the edge, I'm just going to use my eraser tool. The reason I'm not going to care about it looking too sloppy is because I'm going to blend a lot of these out with the mixer brush. So it's going to go slightly outside the edge anyways. So I'm not too worried here. All right, moving down. You know what, for this one, let me do a slightly different skin color. So this one has more of like a shadow look to it. And I just I really like the forms going on in this hand, particularly. And you might be wondering, well, yeah, but it just kind of looks like you're pouring sprinkles in line art right now. I promise you it won't look like this once we get to blending. For the last one, let's choose the lighter skin tone. Actually, another thing we could do is just block out the bottom of this hand, grab our magic wand selection. Oh, is it still going to grab inside? Oh, uh, it still is. Sometimes with line art, I just like to use the selection masking tool. I mask it out and then paint within. Or I'll even create a masking layer on it. I'm 
while I'm doing this, let me find another question here. Uh, Tall, Dark, and Geeky says, what was wondering about how I should go about creating brushes. Like, I love this chalk brush, but I'd like to know how it was created. The brush menu is so intimidating. Uh, we do have a couple tutorials on how to create your own brushes. It really isn't as intimidating as you might think. The easiest way I can tell you right now is create a new PSD file. Make it a perfect square, so like a 10 by 10, for example, 300 resolution. Create whatever shape you want your brush to be in. And then under edit on the top menu, do define brush preset. And from there, you'll kind of figure out how exactly it works. Okay, so now I have our three hands filled in here. So now I'm gonna be switching between a mixer brush and let's see what other normal brush I wanna work with. Probably the flat square brush. Let me see if I like. But I'm gonna give just a slight opacity to it. Yeah, all right, that'll work. Why, well, thank you, Seraphimo Lintu, for following. You know what, I'm gonna turn the shape dynamics pretty much off. Or maybe just like a slight, like that. Okay, so now, on a new layer above all these other layers, I'm gonna first lay out some of our light sources. Because right now, even though we have all these different colors within, it's still reading rather flat. So I'm just going through, I'm not focusing too much on if I'm covering some of the line art. So like I said, these studies are meant to be quick. I'm not going for like a Leonardo da Vinci study of a hand. If anything, I want them to read more fun. And you'll see how the blender brush will really add some interesting things to here. And if you're working with reference, that's great. I, I'm going at this more blind, just for like my own, I'm kind of like testing myself right now. Because with this new like painterly method of creating forms and uh, the shapes, I wanna make sure that I'm testing myself so that I know I can do it on my own. Okay, right. so now with those initial ones laid out, let me show you how this mixer brush works. And you gotta be a little careful because with the mixer brush, it might end up looking a bit blurry. So that's why I usually like to keep my brush on hand <laughs> for adding in more of those edges if they're lost while you're using this mixer brush. And I'm not gonna care that I'm picking up some of that background color. If anything, why don't I just purposely throw in some of that background color, tie it in. Move this brush menu out of the way. So what's great about this is it'll pick up some of the color of wherever you pick the brush up from, and then it'll lay it down on the next stroke that you do. So you can see how every now and then I'll pick up some of that color and lay it back in. 
so I don't lose some of that. And in areas where I know I want some of that edge be kept, I'll just grab my brush tool, kind of fill it in first. As you can see here, go back to my mixer brush. Why, thank you. I'm going to say. Iki I Nutella for following. That one was hard to read from over here. You can see uh, I'm not caring about letting the line art overlap into the hand. I'm okay with it. I think too often I get stuck like over caring about things and I get caught up on like the little details when I shouldn't be focused on that right away if anything that should be near the very end focusing on those small details and I definitely think with reference you can have more color variation because right now to me it's reading kind of flat and I know that like let's say I make a new layer I'm just gonna create a nice little overlay of red or maybe you know what we'll do a soft light and like I was saying in the beginning of having fingers be a little bit more bloody more of that deeper red Maybe where that palm is. Give it some more of that fleshy. Oops. Something like that. So I'm just looking at each section now here of like the upper palm kind of plump all of it out That now essentially I would bring that all over, but I get so wrapped up sometimes in one drawing, I forget that I have other ones I need to be working on here. And with the mixer brush, I try to keep the brush stroke in the same direction of whatever the form is. And then even with like this hand here, I'm gonna bring some more of these circular brush strokes to even further create the illusion of it's being a round object going back in space here. And if you're like me, you probably have these moments of like treating digital too seriously and feeling like there has to be like these guided steps that you have to follow for everything but if anything I feel like that's only hurt me over the years and I'm telling you now that it's good to experiment it's good to play with other techniques that you're not used to and uh, letting the art side of your brain take over while you're doing a drawing like too often we don't do something because we feel like oh that's not following the process that uh, works or that this person told me I'm supposed to do something Mm -hmm. 
while I'm doing some of these fill-ins. Let me see if there's any questions I can get to. Um, Freya Crescent 90 says, Tim, I think the first color is not the right code number. Oh, no. Let me, let me check it out. BA4... Oh, for 83D. You were right. You are definitely right. Hold on. There we go. Sorry about that. So for those of you that are painting along too, whatever way, however you're painting it, on your next one, if you have three of them, try a different method of painting. It doesn't have to be like extremely different, but maybe it's just something that normally you don't and you you try it on this. I'm gonna add some of the, the red near these joints here. And even like this, this is what I wasn't thinking of adding red to this hand. I was gonna keep it more of this gray tone, but I like the contrast that that gives. Thank you, Rawl two six six one 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 for following. And same thing, I'm going to bring some of that background color in here. Blend it out. Mind you, I'm just creating a base for each hand right now. This is not how I expect the final results to look by any means. Okay, our third one here. And you know what, even before I start this third one, I can already tell, I want some color variation here. So let's grab some of that red. Why thank you, Jamarie Sanders 13 for following. Just add more of this pink gradient going down the fingers. Heck, I'm actually going to even make this finger that is overlaying the other two. Just going to make it slightly darker. It's another one of those like personal choices, but it adds a nice contrast and interest. And on this side of the hand, we'll make it more gray. Add more variation of color in here. Let's see how this looks all blended together. Actually, technically I have a reference for this third hand. So like I could be color picking from the photo or I could just do a blind look where I look at, okay, where are the areas of uh, light? Where is it landing on? And I do think those studies are important. But I think it's also good to have fun with uh, drawing hands like this. But I, I do recommend making, mixing in more colors than just what I'm doing here. And if some of that background color gets pulled into the drawing, that's okay. Because I know I'm going to be detailing these out a bit more. So I don't have to worry about keeping it so perfect. And that's something I, I feel like I've been reiterating a lot on a bunch of streams recently. 
I think it's just because I fell into a trap of feeling like I had to have a step for everything and everything had to follow a certain criteria. But I've learned more and more, it's more important to like focus on the fundamentals. So literally your values, your color, your lighting, having those read strong first and then focus on details later. I have way too much of an emphasis on letting the details dictate the quality of an image when really I should first focus on making sure that everything reads right and then worry about the little details. I thank you, Chrono, for following. Something like that. Okay, so now I have kind of these like oil mushed hands. So now is when I would go in and detail each out further. I think for this live stream, I'm going to focus on one of them. But if you are doing these studies on your own, I would definitely recommend doing all three. Actually, I would definitely recommend doing all three. So I'm using the photo as like a guide here. So actually we got somewhat of a, a light on the inside of the thumb. I think what's good about doing these studies with references is oftentimes we think we know how something looks like a thumb or the joint in a hand. And then when you look at a real reference, you're like, oh, is that what they actually look like? And it kind of changes up your whole theory. And, it, and usually for the better. So usually from that point forward, then you'll draw what you noticed from uh, that point forward. Or that's how a real study should work. You, you're learning and then you're applying it to future studies or future pieces, really. Not even, it doesn't have to be a study. Why, thank you, T. Butler1738, for following. So I'm moving around the hand. Definitely have, I'm going to lay in more of this, more salmon color here. Especially for a lot of these wrinkles, creating more of those ridges. Oh, you know what? Let me move this to the middle of the screen. There we go. Add more of those contrast edges. And even on the top of the hand here, it's definitely a bit lighter in value. So I'm going to recreate that as well.
that. And there's a bunch of little grooves in here. So I'm going to grab more of this fleshy red. Create these wrinkles. And then before the stream cuts out, I'm going to show you a quick color balance trick to add even more life to it quickly. Even though sometimes with studies, I think it's good to rely on your color picking ability and not so much on filters and kind of like digital tricks, we call them in the house. While I'm doing this, let me see what other questions we got. Uh, Chrissy McAvee says, okay, completely off topic, but I'm struggling with drawing an older character into a younger version of themselves. Also, I'm having trouble redrawing my characters. I made sure to have nuances in their face, but I'm still trying, struggling to draw them, and I'm not consistent. Any tips? All right, the first one is you really got to look at the way that their faces are shaped and usually simplify them. So if you've already have the old character drawn, look at the shapes on their face and be very aware of those shapes. And if they have like a very round or like a very pointed nose and very like exaggeratedly pointed old nose, and when they're younger, still make it pointed, but just slightly smaller. So I feel like that one is more of just like analyzing and doing your best to capture to the best of your ability. So in that case, I would even look at like references on Google of like looking at someone when they're really old versus really young and pick out what little nuances changed in those pictures. And are you able to uh, capture that? Trying to get a more solid hand here finished before the stream ends. And then for your other question, uh, redrawing characters. Yeah, this has been really weird for me too. If you looked on my, or if you follow my Instagram, you may have saw that last night I posted another drawing of Christina, which is one of my characters from my book. And it's like a weird reminder as I'm doing the comic portion that I'm redrawing the same character over and over. And I feel like it's very strange feeling not creative because you're drawing the same thing over and over again, but you're telling a story. So it's not like it's a bad thing. It just, it's very different. So for those of you who are also trying to like write a book in which you have to draw the same characters over and over, it's a very weird experience. I'll, I'll definitely forewarn you guys now. But in terms of redrawing them over and over, you have to have those little things that make them unique. So whether it's the shape of their eyes, what they keep in their hair, maybe they have like a little tiff or a little, um, what's that called? A cowlick in their hair that is unique to them. You want to make sure that you, you have that. And then every time you draw them that point forward, be sure to include those little nuances. Not only as an easy way to help the reader recognize the character, but an easy way for you to help create the character and have them look uh, the same continually as you, you uh, draw them over and over again. Alright, so now I'm getting closer to 
finishing this off. We got like 10 minutes. I'm going to go in and add more little scratch details. Sometimes with this blender brush, things can look very, I'll say overly simplified and smooth. So you want to make sure you have in some of those touches that uh, bring back some of those hard edges. And the other thing to have them look the same is you have to just keep drawing them over and over. Like, don't just draw one version of them, and then the second time you draw them, it doesn't look like them, and you're like, ah, well, I can't do it. <laughs> you got to draw them like 10 times minimum, and then you'll start picking up on, oh, this is what I keep redrawing for the character. Like, I didn't really notice that. I keep adding uh, this little triangle in their hair and I, I realize I've been doing that every single time and oftentimes those little things that you're you're trying to do they won't speak clear to you until after you've done it quite a few times Now that we're getting closer to the end, so typically I'd probably detail this out a bit longer, but I feel like it's at a good point where I can do some color modification. I'm going to put all of these layers into a group, make a copy of that group, merge them into one. So now I have the hands all on one layer and they're all Uh, blended out without the background being included. So here's my little trick to end this off. I'm going to go to image, adjustment, and color balance. And it's going to bring up this menu here. Put it right there. So now essentially what I like to do is, even though I, I played with colors in the beginning that I want to include, you can see how now we can really add a feeling to those colors. And you know what? I'll move this out of the way. So like look how, actually I really like that. So look at how different these look compared to these. Having these really like almost purpley color and pinks, it adds a slight uneasiness to them. Let me see what they look like with a blue background. You can see how now they really feel almost like sensual. They have this richness to them that they didn't have before with it looking like that. So let's try another one. I'll put those in, its, in a group as well. So let's try doing that again. We'll go to image, adjustment, color balance. Let's say we wanted a slightly warmer one. Mind you, I'm kind of exaggerating these levels to an extreme to really showcase how different you can make them look. There, something like that. And then look at the difference between purple ones and the warm ones. Now I personally really like the purpley ones and I feel like from this point forward I could then edit. And you know what? Even let's throw on a gradient map. Let's see what this looks like. I 
or not, not that. Hold on. There you go. Let's see what a quick gradient map. This is another one of those color tricks that I've done in the past. Obviously, I don't want to keep it looking like that, but if we turn the opacity down, you can see how all of a sudden we have some new colors entering the scene, and it'll like slightly affect, but sometimes it's for the better, sometimes not so much, but that one I kind of like, so I'll save it. Let's try a different one. Let's randomize it. Well, this one I like too. So this is another one of those uh, tricks you can do to edit colors on the fly. Ooh, makes all of our highlights really like a cool blue color. I'm gonna try to find one more before we end off this stream. Well, I'm pretty sure that first one was the winner. Sometimes you'll be caught clicking a lot. So if you're doing this method, just be ready to click. Ooh, okay, that one. Yeah, and then if you ever want to turn up the opacity, you can, but oftentimes it'll make it look really pixely. Just a little is all you need. So even a 12% opacity will do the trick. And there we go. So I hope you guys maybe learned something or two from doing these hand studies. And this is a great practice that I think if you want to be a character artist, you should be doing at least, I don't, I want to say once a week, but I think realistically maybe like once a month is more in the right alley. And just be sure that when you're doing hands, be open to be exaggerating them first and then reel it in, pull back the realism in. And like I said, I feel like this is a video that you could watch at any time. And I feel like I'm going to do more of these in the future. I'll probably do different um, features and body parts. So I might do like an arm one time. I might do a foot, the legs, the head. And I'll just do them where we're exaggerating them first, pulling it in, and then doing just a quick color pass. Nothing too, too serious, more fun, laying down colors, splashing them on, and see the end result. And I think having that mentality first, and then you can go into refining, will help. Because I feel like, Right from the get-go, when I learned digital art, it was so focused on refining that I never really experienced how to add energy and flow into your pieces. And I've, I've come to realize how important that is. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, that's all I got for you guys today. So thank you so much for coming. I'm going to be posting my final hands in the post below where it says hand references download. So if you guys, if you guys were working alongside me today, I would love to see what you guys came up with in drawing your own hands. So please post there. I'll also link to some of the artists I talked about, including Cynics and Koei Kun. And I'll even link the video of Cynics' hand video. I find it very, you know, not, not even just entertaining because I, I find his humor appreciated, but they're so insightful on his, the little things that he focuses on with the details. And I, I think that's a video you should check out if you're interested more with hands. Okay, and that's all I got. I, that's all I got. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. And uh, usually I tell you guys what we're going to be doing a week in advance. So let's see. I'll probably actually pick from the suggest a stream idea forum post. So if you have an idea that you want to suggest, please put it in the link below where it says suggest a stream idea. And I will be most likely picking from one of those for next week's stream. But I want to do another one where it's very, 
either follow along or step by step or giving more insight on something on how to uh, draw something specific. So, okay. Thank you guys. And hopefully we'll see you next week. All right. Bye. Bye, 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 bye.